Okay, so um, we tried this last night, sharing the um, uh, presentation. It was a bit of a interesting um, experience, but we got there in the end. So hopefully you can see that. Um, yeah, I'm taking I'm taking that as a yes. I can't. Um, All good. Brilliant. So um, as. Claire said, "I'm uh, my name's Claire Claire Tupling. I'm from I'm senior lecturer in postgraduate studies at the University of Derby, and I also stammer, so I have a fair bit of experience of um, of what it's like to be a, a, a member of the academy, an academic in in um, the." university and all the challenges that, that can bring and particularly the challenges over the last year or so with uh, remote or online learning as a result of the pandemic so um what i'm focusing on and what i'm talking about in in this presentation is is the idea that stammering is made material by by a lecture capture so it's, stammering is produced essentially by what happens in in the university. So lecture capture, um, if you're not familiar with it, is a kind of activity where the use of digital video technology is used to record live lectures or pre-recorded presentations for um, students to access. Um, and so... By focusing on, on lecture capture, what I intend to do is to illuminate how this stammering is made is made material. So there we go. I can um, shovel over to the next uh, slide. Um, so what I'm focusing on in uh, the presentation is I'm going to outline firstly how... Um, higher education pursues this these policies of inclusionism um, as we've heard some some of the examples about this morning however this occurs in the context of ab ableism so i'm saying something quite controversial really that although higher education is saying yeah we're we're trying to make higher education more accessible that still isn't actually challenging the inherent ableist structures in higher education. Um, I'm going to uh, try and explain how stammering is socio-material because it is a theoretical con con concept. Um, I'll then go on to considering the ways in which lecture capture is implicated in that production of stammering and how the digital aspects of the higher education are a key part of this and then go on to considering the way in which stammering can help us to crip the corona politics of the um, academy and that comes from um, a theory called crip theory that's quite um, popular amongst disability scholars um, mainly in the United States United States it's a term that maybe we're not that um, comfortable with the term crip and ripping but it is um, an approach to understanding disability um, so as I mentioned higher education um, is involved in the active pursuit of inclusion policies so adjustments to um, practice um, reasonable you know, accommodation Dations is a greater awareness of the needs of students with disabilities and staff with disabilities and higher education institutions are aware of their responsibilities under um, the Equality Act. Um, and, and they have a duty to protect their staff and their students from discrimination and from from um, from from harassment and to provide those reasonable um, 
accommodations and higher education institutions understandably celebrate the fact that they are um, putting in these efforts to make higher education more accessible. However, um, there are disability scholars that would critique this. They don't critique particularly the reasonable adjustments. They welcome those, but they highlight the ways in that despite these efforts that are required by legislation, that the underlying ableist structures are not really challenged. So for example, um, if you can um, see how um, a student might be given extra time on a presentation, on, on an oral presentation, um, but yet those fundamental fundamentally understandings of what is a good presentation remain and there are assumptions around how a fluent presentation is a good uh, a present a presentation whereas what I'm suggesting is that we should actually challenge those understandings of what is a good presentation um, so in order to really achieve greater inclusion in higher education, um, that we need to challenge those fundamental ableist structures. Um, so let's get on to um, how stammering is socio material, because this is really this is kind of the theory from the social sciences that might kind of blow you mind if you're not careful so um hannah arendt in the in the human condition observes that speech is essential to being a, a human being um and on the one hand this uh, makes sense it, um, speech is a key means by which we communicate and it is one of the dominant forms of communication um, within the academy. However, um, there are those who cannot use speech. So sign language users, for example, are no less human because they communicate through sign. So if we look differently at speech and rather than thinking that speech is um representational of the of the human but is actually agentic um so that means that it is produced by something by both a human speaker but also as a result of interaction with other non-humans and so my thinking here is influenced by the work of Mase and also later um, Mase and Jackson, who talk about a voice without organs and they um, emphasize how um, speech is created through um, interactions with, with things. So, Stammering offers us a way of being able to understand how speech is produced in, in a socio-material way. So stammering is a very public display. It is only really recognised to be a problematic when interacting with somebody or with something. So um, using the phone, for example, is often experienced as challenging by people who Dama. So we interact with the phone to mediate a conversation and stammering becomes much more pronounced as, as a consequence. So we might stammer when we speak to ourselves, but that it, it doesn't have any consequences. It's only when our speech comes into contact with somebody or something else that, um, that we find this to be a challenge. Um, so this is an example of, of, of how speech is socio-material. It, it, it occurs within a network. Um, and Meg Sanchez describes how oral 
communication um, is a key factor in the distribution of discursive power. So in other words, speech is rarely the authentic voice of the human in higher education, but it is produced and it is silenced through power relationships. And speech can be used to control and it can be used to marginalize. And um, that goes back to my er earlier point. I believe that stammering or, or disfluency more general is, is certainly, um, it, it isn't on the agenda of, of higher education. So fluent speech is seen as the most desirable. Um, stammering is seen as something that is deficient. Um, so if we look at um, lecture capture, so I could have chosen any number of things within higher education to demonstrate this, um, the way in which stammering is um, a socio-material production. But I'm focusing on um, lecture capture because it's been such a prominent feature of the last year or so. So lecture capture is exactly that. It captures the lecture or presentation. Um, so that can be a live session, a pre-recorded session. Um, and there are tools to do this. So the one that I'm familiar with in our institution is Panopto. So um, there is um, what Panopto does is do a screen capture. It records um, the, your lecture and your presentation. It then um, creates a video that is available on the virtual learning environment. So um, students can then access that. Um, if they're unable to access a live session, they can revisit the presentation. Um, they can access presentations in, in their own time. And so these are presented or positioned by higher education institutions as an inclusive practice. This is how this is one of the things that we do to make higher education more accessible. Um, so um, one of the issues with lecture capture is um, the captioning. So there's part of the inclusive practice is that any presentation or teaching session that you deliver will then be captioned. So that um, subtitles. Um, essentially. So that increases the accessibility because students who um, are deaf or hard of hearing or for whatever reason need to use the captions will have that greater accessibility. And um, I'm not arguing against the need to caption presentations. That seems um, um, a positive thing. But I think we need to consider the implications that this has for people who stammer. So the captioning isn't done by a human being on the whole. This is done by um, the automatic captioning system within Panopto or whatever system that you use. Um, and anybody who was on Twitter at the start of the pandemic might have seen um, their fluent colleagues um, sharing their oh so funny stories of how Panopto incorrectly captioned uh, their presentation and um, you know some of the funny ways the funny um, miss captioning that this technology did. And um, I kind of had some empathy with that, but it was kind of, well, welcome to, welcome to 
my world, this is um, something that Panopto fails to do every time I engage with it. It completely changes the words that I'm using to something else that bears no resemblance to um, what I'm saying. Um, so these the automatic captioning within tools like Panopto um, are designed to work with fluent speech. Um, they're quite sophisticated in the sense that a lot of them rely on machine learning. So you can train the lecture captioning software to recognize um, your individual speech pattern. But the unpredictability of stammering and the shifts in the way that we speak and pronounce words that might change in the course of one teaching session or one presentation make that very difficult for these machine learning uh, tools to actually learn our speech pattern. They assume that you're using fluent speech, so they try to create a word out of every block or alternatively you, you get an error message that comes up that reads that it's um your your speech is inaudible or they cannot it cannot be captioned um <coughs> so universities also emphasize um that there's a high level of accuracy about these captioning services. And therefore, if the software isn't accurately captioning um, your speech, the problem is with your speech. It, it isn't with the software. It isn't with the tool that you're using because, again, that's positioned as a, an essential tool of an inclusive practice. So um, the guidance that um, I, that our institution has on their um, the Panopto pages is um, to enhance the accuracy of the captioning system. It says, speak clearly into the microphone on your computer or laptop. So they're... I'm being told that I need to um, essentially change the way I speak. Um, so it's tough, essentially. If I have to spend all day correcting captions, the fault isn't with the technology. The fault is with my uh, speech. Um, and there is a, a fundamental belief um, within higher education that Lecture capture is an inclusive practice. And that absolute um, unwavering belief in that actually prevents any exploration around what reasonable adjustments might be appropriate to um, um, for lecturers who who dumber um, um, and or indeed um it, if if you had a human if you paid somebody to um to transcribe what i was um saying that that would be helpful but it's um that is rarely offered as an as an option it's you've got to change the captions on um your lectures and your presentations um so lecture capture is um a part of this, what I've called the digitalization of disfluency. Um, so this is again an example of how stammering is produced. It's is materially produced as a result of our interaction with the digital tools within higher education. Um, for, so through lecture capture, stammering is um, captured. It's reproduced and cons consumed. So in pre-digital times, if you can remember that far back, um, when we held face-to-face -face meetings or face-to-face -face teaching, 
stammering happened. Um, those episodes of stammering might have been difficult. They might have been traumatic, but they were f- they were fleeting. They kind of went. Once it was over, it was over. But n- now they're captured in a digital form for you know with um, up to seven years. I think universities. Um, or even longer that they they can be kept for in, in hypothetically they can be kept for indefinitely. So sometimes, um, often even stammering isn't pleasant. Um, those secondary features um, such as um, um, f- facial expressions, the pain of a block. Um, are now recorded and made available to our students um, for their consumption. Um, and these can be quite intimate, uncomfortable moments of, of uh, uh, stammering. And um, I know the previous speaker referred to some of the micro aggressions that might be caught on camera. So it's a very similar, uh, a similar thing. Um, I've mentioned the issue of the captioning, and I think that this creates additional labor um, for people who stammer. I know other people have had different experiences that their institutions have allowed them to upload a transcript. Um, um, but again, that's you expected to produce a script that fluent lecturers aren't uh, expected to do. So there's still that expectation that you will cor- correct your speech even if it's not your speech your actual spoken words that you're correcting you will correct um the speech in text form um and you can't argue against that because it's an inclusive practice um whereas i think we should be able to have conversations about um alternative ways of providing accessible lectures and present and again paying somebody possibly to do that transcriptions um stammering becomes digitally mediated so that's not just lectures it's not just presentations it's the business of the academy like meetings uh held by teams it's a different dynamic um we've heard already that they might offer increased inclusivity um so that hands up um that has um been um really beneficial for me over the last year or so so that so this this isn't all bad news it's an opportunity i think to redefine the way that we do things in in higher education um but one of those um, risks, I think, of the digitalization of disfluency is this vulnerability to um, a deficit discourse. So because stammering is captured and experienced digitally, the evidence of it, as I said before, remains beyond the moment of of stammering and we know that stammering is the subject of ridicule um you can see this all over the internet clips of joe biden um stammering are used to question his competence um and i know from personal experience and the experience of others that um that i've been on the receiving end of um stammering being used as um a means of questioning my a competence um and we know from research that fluent that less fluent speech is associated with um lower student ratings of their of their lecturers so um what can we do about it um uh, it isn't all doom and gloom. It might feel as though um, the, the university is a, is, a, is a challenging place for, for people who stammer. It is a, a fluent space, um, one that privileges 
fluent speech. But I think if we take this idea of cripping the corona politics of the um, academy, we can find a way forward. So as I said before, cripping is this idea of crip theory. Um, it's more popular in the US than it is here, but the idea is to use our disability to challenge this taken for granted asso- assumptions about the time and space um, of the of the academy and Corona politics um, is a term that refers to the way in which time works in in um, in high in higher ed- education. So there's um, certain requirements around time uh, about when things should be done and how quickly they sh- should take. Um, so f- fluent speech thrives in the current corona politics of the academy and disfluent speech doesn't thrive because as Bennett and Burke um, rightly point out, individuals have differential access to resources which can be used to manage time. So people who stammer may not be able to align their speech to the time requirements of higher education. So stammering actually, um, so rather than seeing that as a deficit, I think we can um, see this as a as, as a means of a way forward. So stammering disrupts the timescape. So by by simply stammering, we're showing that actually time is different for us than it might be for other um, other speakers. So rather than just seeing this as something that um, can be solved by adding an extra five minutes to an assessed presentation, which I think lacks any kind of innovation in thinking about presentations, we can actually see stammering as um, an opportunity to challenge the way that things are done in higher education. So the moment of stammering is a liminal zone. It's going to go one way or the other. And invariably, everything works out fine if you wait for the words to come. So we can offer our peers um, an important lesson about focusing on the content rather than the superficial focus on the slick, timely performance um, so stammering is a radical act I would say that um, it's often experienced as something uncomfortable by both the speaker and the listener there are people that want to intervene to make things easier usually for them and this is how stammering works so we we and um, I think we all know people who hide their stammer um, in un- un- universities. They appear to be fluent, although they stammer. And there's a good reason why they continue to um, hide, hide, hide their stammer. So therefore, I think stammering then becomes a radical act. If you're prepared to stammer openly, you're kind of reclaiming that space for yourself. You're reclaiming that right to say, you know, I speak in a different way. Just hang on in there, wait for me to finish. So to finish off, really, I would say that this fluency offers a lens to critique fluency-centric assumptions. Um, So this is not just about claiming the right not to hide our stammer, which I think is important. But if we can get if we can stammer openly um, and also get the job done, then we decenter fluency as the marker of efficient higher education practices. So people are reassured by fluency. Uh, And I think this creates a false sense of 
security. So um, the, um, in the paper by Carpenter et um, al. in 2016, they discuss how ac academic settings afford the opportunity for students to be vulnerable to this illusion of knowing. So if you hear something spoken fluently, you think that must be true, that must be more valid than um, anything that's spoken with a disfluent voice. So therefore, if it sounds fluent, it must be good, and we know it clearly isn't. Um, so universities, um, if they're anything, they should be places where ideas can be challenged and um, where that where those ideas and um, taken for granted assumptions can can really be questioned. Um, Joshua Saint Pierre, who um, some of you will know, he discusses the ways in which um, we can draw on the disfluent voice as a tool of critique. Um, so the the management of stammering, anybody that stammers will tell you that it invites creativity, um, that it demonstrates resilience, um, that we people who stammer may have a greater ability to be empathetic and a, a greater ability to be good listeners, all of which are needed, um, not only in higher education. So our experiences need to be applied positively highlighting the limits of fluency and presenting the possibilities of what is possible with disfluent speech. Um, so that's um, where I'd like to finish off. <laughs>